Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, we are going to sing number 301, Let Us Build a House, before we start today. And we're going to do the first and the last verses. So verse 1 and verse 5. build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live a place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive built of hopes and dreams and visions rock of faith and vault of may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Cody Sandall, pastor here at the First Presbyterian Church of Littleton. Good to be back with you again. And uh, we always like to start off by sharing ways for you to connect more deeply with each other and more deeply with the living God. A few things to share with you. First off, uh, if you saw on the e-blast that the WizKids uh, tutoring program is looking for two female tutors, um, the celebration is they already found them. So excellent. Uh, share that celebration. Also, starting next week, we have our new fall worship times where we will be all together at 10 a.m. And a reminder, you know, this was a, a long debate uh, before I went through, I went on my sabbatical, and the, the idea there was that we were all going to be together as 
one church and the value of doing that uh, and investing in the relationships together and 10 o'clock was kind of the latest we could get most of the early people and 10 o'clock was about the earliest we could get some of the later people. So everyone's going to be mildly displeased next week, but happy to see each other and that is the primary value. So uh, we will also have Sunday school at nine o'clock. Um, I'm gonna start a pastor's book club. Um, this is especially if you, if you like to think, um, this will be for you. So next week uh, in Ayers Parlor, we will have um, our first meeting of the pastor's book club. I'll show you some of the books I've picked out as options, we can pick one and then a month later we'll meet to discuss it. Uh, and Children's Sunday School will be at nine as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, during my sermon about why we're doing that. One thing that Session wanted to mention um, is because the kids are gonna be with us in worship and they are not able to have vaccines yet, was encouraging people to wear masks uh, as you are able and comfortable in worship. I'm gonna wear my mask uh, unless I'm speaking. Uh, but to help the kids, you know, not have to miss any days of school because of church. So uh, to protect them until they can get their vaccines, we are encouraging people to wear masks since they're going to be with us in worship and they'll be coming up and, and interacting a lot more, which is good, but things we have to think about these days. Um, also, on next week, we are having the Samaritan's Purse. Uh, we're going to assemble boxes in Ficklin Hall. This is part of uh, a mission, a new mission, this Operation Christmas Child. It's hard to think about Christmas, uh, although some of the stores, I think, are already putting stuff out. Uh, but we're thinking about how to serve people for Christmas. This sends uh, local partners around the world these shoe boxes that are filled with small toys, hygiene items, school supplies, and it also has stuff about Jesus. So it's a service, but also sharing the good news of Jesus. It's a, it's a combination here. Uh, and it goes to children affected by war, poverty, natural dis disasters, famine, and disease. And it also goes to children in the United States on uh, Native American reservations. So that's who will be receiving these boxes. Uh, and starting next week, we're going to assemble them. You can take one, and we'll have instructions on how to fill it. So I know it's hard to think about Christmas, but next week, we're starting to think about Christmas uh, with that mission um, after church on September 12th. On September 19th, we have another mission partner. This is kind of mission fall right now. Uh, Gilbert with Love With Actions. I, uh, I like to say, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty busy guy, but Gilbert makes me feel like I'm a slacker. Uh, he's in Rwanda, and the mission that he does is he, um, he, on his website, he says that there's like an estimated 65 million primary and secondary school-aged children in the world who have disabilities. 50% of them are out of school, and that's a big problem in Rwanda. He gets the medical care. He gets them life-changing surgery. He gets them into school and changes families' lives, and he does it every single day. He does, it's amazing what he does in Rwanda. He's going to be with us next uh, on September 19th in worship. He's going to have a Sunday school class as well, so we're going to get to hear a lot about Gilbert on September 19th. Um, and, uh, and a great example of the impact that this church has in supporting its mission. But as we bring ourselves into worship today, as we still our hearts, still our minds, still our souls and remind ourselves of the reasons we are grateful to be here. Let us worship God. Please join in hymn 364 in your hymnal, Lift Up the Gates, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. Lift up the gates eternal, lift up your voices. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. See, all the earth is God, his people, the nations. God built it on the deeps and laid its foundations. Lift up the gates of glory. Mountain who stand in praising those who. 
first verse. Who is the King of glory? Who will your singing? Lord God, the Lord of hosts of victory is bringing. Lift up the gates eternal, lift up your voices. The King of glory comes a nation rejoices. Let's prepare, let me start again. <laughs> Let's prepare to hear the word of God. Let us pray for elimination. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. Let not our doubts nor our darkness speak to us. Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. May our hearts always welcome your love. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. I'll begin with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as they had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. And moving on to our prayer of confession, let us approach together the one who is the embodiment of mercy, trusting in his love and compassion for all people. Our prayer of confession begins as we pray in silence. And aloud, together, gracious God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Find in us, we pray, the pockets of resistance and patches of coldness that keep us close to your movement among us. Root them out and open us that we may be agents of your grace and channels of your love. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy upon us. I encourage you to hear and to believe, <clears throat> excuse me, the good news, God, who is the embodiment of mercy, calls us to new life and gives us strength and more than that, stamina to begin again and again. Friends, in Christ Jesus, we are all forgiven. 
forgive yourself, forgive each other, and live in peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the be seated. This is a song I learned uh, during my sabbatical, and it runs through different stories from the Bible as a way to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness in the past and that God hasn't changed when we wonder if God is going to be faithful now. Just ask the who waves if they are still at the mention of his name. And they'll say, my God is still the same. Just ask the who walls if they still fall at the mighty sound of the praise. And they'll say, God is still the same. But when did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has and never will. My God is still the same. If they're heard, they'll say, My God is still the same. Just ask the grave if it's strong enough to keep hope in its chains. It'll say, God is still the same. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has and never will. My God is still the same. change never has and never will my god is still the same but not once did he ever stop moving not once did he ever let go not once did he ever stop moving our god is in control not once did he ever stop moving not once did he ever let go not once did he ever stop moving our god is in control when did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has and never will. My God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy change? Never has and never will. My God is still the same. Sorry, I just noticed the battery on that microphone died right at the beginning of the song, so you probably didn't even hear that. <laughs> on the recording, it'll look like my mouth is just moving. <laughs> well, we are continuing our series about gratitude, and uh, last week we talked about the power of gratitude. It is called the mother of all virtues because it greases the wheels for other positive things in your life. This week, we are grateful to be together. And I believe the last 18 months have really shown us the value 
and the power of being together safely. And I, I know my sabbatical time was probably a little uh, different experience uh, in terms of being together uh, since I wasn't here with you. But, but I've heard great things about how connected y'all were during my sabbatical. I've seen some of those tremendous pictures of the concert that Mary put together. I have uh, saw some pictures and a good report of the, the game night that Karen, Melissa, and Kate and the Christian Education Committee put together. And I heard great things about the leadership of Carol and Linda as well. If you remember, we commissioned them in prayer uh, right before I left for sabbatical. And actually, I would like to bookend that now. And they didn't know this was coming. But I would invite Linda and Carol to maybe come forward. <laughs> so as we commissioned you in prayer at the start of the sabbatical, I now want to offer prayers of thanksgiving and blessing over you at the end of it. Uh, if you felt blessed by their leadership during my sabbatical, would you please stand as we pray for them? Holy God, we are so grateful for the servant leadership and compassionate hearts of Carol and Linda. I know I was greatly blessed knowing that the church was in capable hands. I have heard from so many who were also blessed by their words, their care, their leadership, their decisions, their presence over the summer. I pray that they feel the gratitude of this church, and I pray that they hear your words telling them, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Will you join me in thanking Carol and Linda for their leadership during this sabbatical? <laughs> I wanted an honest reaction. So there. <laughs> thank you both. Uh, we invested in being together over the summer, and we will continue to focus and invest in that in the fall. That's one of our primary goals and objectives is to keep investing in those relationships. And today we're going to be grateful to be together. Let's hear some of the value of being together from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord, so thanks be to God. Well, I'm sure you saw the photo on the cover of the bulletin. If you skipped over that, you can take a look at it now. The photo there shows worshipers in the remains of a Catholic church in Haiti, from last Sunday. Uh, the most recent earthquake there destroyed many buildings, including many churches around the country, and yet, there they were, on Sunday, gathering together. Even if they had to meet outside next to the ruins of their church, even if they had to share fold-out metal chairs, even if their own homes and lives were disrupted, even if they were hungry like so many in Haiti, even with all that. There they were, last Sunday, gathering together. I bet they're gathering this Sunday too, maybe even right now. What is it about the followers of Jesus gathering together that is so powerful? What is it about the followers of Jesus gathering together that so feeds our souls? Our text today gives us a few highlights. It says, we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. That's what you all thought this morning, right? What does that mean? Well, in the Jewish temple, there was a place thought to be the place where God was most manifest and present. It was called the Holy of Holies. And that was only to be entered by the high priest and then only once per year. 
And yet in our text today, it says we have the same access to God every day that the high priest received once per year. This would be like having the assurance that should you decide to go to England and should you decide to show up at Buckingham Palace, the queen would drop whatever she's doing to have tea with you right then. No RSVP needed, no questions asked. That's hospitality. It's like one of the guys from my brother's high school basketball team who would just show up unannounced inside our house. And no, he did not have a key, but he found a way in every time. And he'd be eating our food usually in our kitchen. Our text says, through the blood of Jesus, that's the kind of access we have to God. <coughs> have the full assurance of faith, because Jesus gave you a key to the house. When we gather together as followers of Jesus, we enter with confidence into the presence of the living God. I mean, if you wanted to get an autograph from a you know, Denver Broncos player, you might have to wait for hours, for five seconds. But you can get into the presence of the creator of the universe today with no strings attached. Our text then goes on to talk about our hearts being sprinkled clean. And uh, you know I like to do poll questions during my sermons. So get your arm ready. I know you probably did not miss this while I was away. But uh, if, raise your hand if you are confident enough to admit you might have disappointed God sometime this last week. Sinners. <laughs> Okay, that was all of us. <laughs> we need our hearts to be cleansed. We need it every week, probably every day. And when we gather together, we have confidence that such cleansing is offered freely through the blood of Christ. You can buy all the Clorox wipes you want, all the medicines you want. Nothing other than Jesus will be able to sprinkle your heart clean. Our text then goes on to say, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. This is kind of the same idea as the song I at least attempted to sing uh, before the sermon, that God was faithful and powerful when Jesus calmed the waves of the storm. God was faithful and powerful when the Israelites were marching around Jericho and the walls fell down. God was faithful and powerful when Jesus decided to die for us when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. God was faithful and powerful when Jesus rose again from the grave on Easter and our God is still the same. When we gather together, we get to remind each other of the times when God has been faithful and powerful and merciful and loving and present in our own lives. Because God is still the same. When we gather together, we get to remind each other of the times when the Holy Spirit has given us insights we did not possess, the words we couldn't fathom ourselves, the name of someone who needed us just at that time, or the times when someone spoke to us at just the right time in just the right way. We remind ourselves of those times because our God is still the same today. When we gather together, we restore our hope by reminding each other of God's faithfulness in the past. Do you have a story like that? Do you have a moment like that? Do you remember God's presence or power or faithfulness at some moment in your life? If you can remember one of those moments, remember that God is still the same. I'm going to go a little bit out of order here in our text. I'm going to come back to verse 24. But in verse 25, it says, we should not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So we see another benefit of gathering together is encouragement. If you're feeling low, sitting alone and stewing on your thoughts is probably not going to help. Even for introverts, it's really hard to encourage ourselves. That's where gathering together is needed. And when we gather as the followers of Jesus, we can encourage each other from the strength that we've already talked about today, the faithfulness of God, our unwavering hope in Jesus, our ability to enter with confidence into the presence of our Creator and hearts that can be sprinkled clean. A couple of days ago, uh, I was feeling a, a bit down. It was actually a couple of weeks ago. And I received a random verbal prayer on my phone. Uh, from my friend and brother in Christ, Pastor Mutimwi in Masvingo, Zimbabwe. He had recorded himself praying for me, 
and for my sons and for my wife and for this church and, and for my spirit. And it was several minutes long. Like it wasn't like a 20-second prayer. It was several, it was like seven minutes long of this prayer that he just sent out of the blue to me across the ocean. That connection with a follower of Jesus encouraged me more than anything else that day. <clears throat> but I want to pause there for a, a couple of points. First off, Pastor Mutimwi and I spent like all one whole day together uh, a couple of years ago, but we haven't physically seen each other since. But we stay in touch online. So we can still gather together as the followers of Jesus. When I talk about being grateful to be together, what I want to say is I don't exclusively mean Sunday morning worship. That is the most obvious one, clearly. But that is not the only way I am grateful that we can be together. I'll be starting, as I mentioned, the monthly book club, starting next week, 9 o'clock at the Sunday school time. That is a way to be together. I'll be restarting my men's Bible study soon. That's a way to be together. Our shabby sheep women's groups are getting going again. That's a way to be together. We have women's circle meetings. That is a way to be together. Serving side by side is a way to be together. And some of us can also feel that same connection by video or phone or recorded voice across the continents. This, this morning, we called my, uh, my grandmother and Caleb saw his, his great grandmother for the first time because she finally got internet access in her home and she was you know, weeping. That video connection was real. Sunday morning isn't the only way to be grateful to be together. And we learned that over the last 18 months, right? I mean, even when we weren't in the sanctuary due to COVID, we had outdoor meetings, at-home communion deliveries, phone calls, Zoom Bible studies, outdoor coffee meetings. Maybe those were not your favorite way to gather, but they still achieved many of the same results mentioned in our text from Hebrews. So that's point one, but I want to go back to Pastor Mutimwi at the Presbyterian Church in Masfingo, Zimbabwe, because they have not been able to gather together in any shape for five months. And their country and community, if you know anything about Zimbabwe, that it was rough going before COVID. So add five months without gathering, five months without encouragement, five months without restoring each other's hope, five months without income for him as the pastor, his church has struggled. He has struggled. His family has struggled. They need our prayers for encouragement and for unwavering hope and for Jesus to do something unexpectedly good for them. They need our prayers. And I share this for two reasons. First off, I actually do hope you will pray for Pastor Mutimwi and uh, the, our sisters and brothers in Zimbabwe. I would hope you, if you can't remember Mutimwe, I understand that, but Zimbabwe, you can remember Zimbabwe, right? So pray for Zimbabwe this week. And I actually told him how to access the video of our worship service. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, turn around. You can wave to the camera. I don't know if it'll pick you up at all. But Pastor Matemwe, we are, we are praying for you and for your church. Um, and if you couldn't see that, everyone was turning around and, and waving. So second, I want us to remind ourselves of our reasons to be grateful. Because we can be together. We talked about that last week. If you spend your time listing all the ways in your head that, well, this isn't like normal yet, and this isn't like normal yet, and this isn't like normal yet, you're poisoning your heart. Put your mind instead on the reasons to be grateful, the reasons that we can celebrate. Yes, even if we, many of us still have masks on, we are together. Even if we're a little more spread out than we would be normally, we're together, even if there are little adjustments in our process. We are together. And not everyone can say that right now. So I encourage you, be grateful that we are together. Stew on your gratitude, not your annoyances. Everyone will be better for it, and it's a way better stew. After the worship service in the ruins of his church building in Haiti last Sunday, one of the congregants said this, when we gather, we sing together, we pray together, we eat together, it allows us to face the challenges of life. When we can't do that, we're not in a good situation. That's someone who is grateful to be together, even when things were far from normal. Like I said, I'm going to slide back to verse 24 here. 
Uh, and we're going to change gears a little bit. Because up until now, I've been talking about all these things that happen just like by natural faith osmosis. Like when we gather, uh, these things just tend to happen kind of no matter what we're doing. But verse 24 says, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. What a fascinating and, let's admit it, weird choice of words. I mean, what comes to mind when I say provoke, right? I mean, like when my brother and I were fighting every day growing up, my parents might want to know who started it, who provoked the other one, right? Or nations will quibble about, well, who provoked who before a battle? And that negative connotation, that kind of conflict connotation, is exactly the same in the original Greek. Provoke is a great way to translate this. If you wanted to quibble a little bit, you could maybe pick the word annoy. Is that any better? I think that's even weirder. Let's annoy one another to love and good deeds. That's, that's not helping, right? So on my first Sunday as the acting children's director at a church in Austin, I was a bit nervous. I like to have everything organized, and ready to go, and on time, preferably early, actually. And when I'm nervous, I get more detailed, more organized, more regimented. And so that meant for the first time when the, you know, the chaos of 60 kids was about to come in, I had everything ready, but there was one problem, no kids yet, because I had it completely ready 20 minutes early and nothing to do. <laughs> Just wait. <clears throat> I hate waiting. So I was like pacing around the room, waiting for them to arrive, and one of the other leaders watched me pacing around and told me something like, you're going to scare the kids with all that pacing. And so I, you know, I was annoyed at first, uh, I was provoked at first, uh, but I thought he was right. And so I sat down, calmed myself, prepared my smile, and got ready for the kids before their arrival. He provoked me into being a better children's director that day by saying that. One of the purposes of gathering together is to help each other follow Jesus better. Not just refill our spiritual tank, that's great but sometimes we actually need to fix the spiritual car, too. That's really hard to do just on your own. And I have shared before that I have wide but not infinite bounds when it comes to differences in our, uh, within our faith in Jesus. And one of the things that is very important to me is that, uh, that someone has felt challenged to change. If your faith has never challenged any part of your life, you're probably not reading enough of the Bible. There's a lot of love and acceptance and forgiveness and grace, yes. There is also a call to live a life that God imagined for you when he created you. And that's challenging. It's helpful to have others who can provoke you to love and good deeds. Not just provoke you, but provoke you to love and good deeds. And that is pretty hard to do on Sunday morning. When was the last time, like we're doing the passing of the peace Right, back when we were doing that, and you like tried to provoke someone to love and good deeds. Anyone ever done that during the passing of the peace? No? Mm -mm. Yeah, no, not going to happen, right? Uh, but I have done that in small groups. I've shared difficult things in small groups. I've, I've shared that in classes, or especially one-on-one -on -one meetings or Bible studies. We talk about hard things. If you're not connected with some kind of group of people where people know you well enough to provoke you, to love and good deeds, you're missing out on an essential part of the faith. Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. That when we have that connection, our branch can thrive and live and grow. But when we are disconnected, we wither and die. If you, if you tear off a branch and you throw it on the ground, what's going to happen? It's going to die, unless it's a weed, and then it will somehow burrow into the soil and sprout. Why is it only the bad things that do that? That's one of my questions for heaven. But I digress. It comes down to this. Connect or die. Connect and grow or die and wither. There are a lot of options. You can look through our bulletin this week. All this, time, all this stuff is starting back up. If you don't know where you want to connect with a group that can help you grow and not wither, if you don't know where to connect, talk to me. Talk to Pastor Carroll. One of the great things about our size of church is you can get personalized service to connect. So connect. Don't wither. The last thing I want to highlight today is the impact of children gathering together 
with the followers of Jesus. I mentioned this earlier. When I was growing up in church, I know I went to Sunday school. I don't have any major memories of it until much later in my life. I, I remember the pastor's children's sermons. I remember singing hymns. That's how I know so many today. I remember my parents making me memorize the Lord's Prayer before I could have that little snack they were passing once a month. I, <laughs> I remember singing in the children's choir, still know some of those songs, and I remember drawing on the bulletin in worship. Not surprisingly, if you know me, I was drawing robots, uh, but my lame parents said they couldn't have weapons, so that was a flashlight, not a laser, Mom. <laughs> now, being in worship for years, though, years, made me feel at home in worship. Hearing those hymns for years made me know the hymns. Hearing the prayers for years led me to eventually memorize the Lord's Prayer. And yes, even though I was drawing robots with flashlights, I was listening too. A perfect example of this actually came last week. One of the kids who was with us in worship last week was, was drawing, and it was a picture of a bear. It was a great picture of a bear. And he said it was a grateful bear. He was listening. What a fabulous, this was not Caleb, this was someone else. So this was a fabulous example, though, of you, you don't know that they're listening. They're listening. And it's a fabulous picture, too. OK, time for some more sermon polls, but no arms needed for this one. You, just, you can just give me a verbal amen if you agree with any of these things. If you want kids to feel at home in worship, give me an amen. If you want kids to know your favorite hymns, give me an amen. amen. If you want kids to learn the Lord's Prayer, give me an amen. amen. If you want kids to feel like they are part of this family of faith, give me an amen. amen. They have to be with us to do that. And that's where we're going to start next week. <laughs> didn't even, didn't even pre-cue that. <laughs> So Sunday school is still going to be there for the kids. It's going to be earlier, just like with, for the adults. It's going to be 9 o'clock. Kids are going to be in worship. They can stay with their families. That's great. They can join Melissa and others in the back. Um, um, and Melissa has some fabulous ideas for integrating the kids more into worship. We're still finalizing these. But like one week, they might help with the offering. One week, they might bring the communion elements up during worship. One week, they might share prayers verbally. And every week, you can make them feel welcome and at home and part of this spiritual family. You can help them do that. Learn their names. Greet them by name. Celebrate their presence and demonstrate the love, the love of Christ to them. I am going to try to provoke all of us here to love and good deeds. Every time you learn a kid's name and greet them by name, you're part of their discipleship journey. Every time they come up for a, a children's sermon and, or singing and they see your smiling, supportive face, you're a part of their discipleship journey. Every time their parents feel welcomed and at home here and supported, you're part of their discipleship journey. So I hope you will choose to be a part of the discipleship journey of the children and the families of this church. It's not hard. It happens over years. But everyone can take part in these small ways. Sisters and brothers, it is truly a wonderful thing when the followers of Christ gather together. Maybe that's on Sunday for worship. Maybe that's a Sunday school class. Maybe that's a midweek Bible study. Maybe that's a book club or a women's circle or a walking group. Maybe that's serving together. Maybe it's even on Zoom or the phone or recording prayers to send across the world. When we gather, somehow, the Spirit of the Lord is there too. We must connect or we will wither and die. I am so grateful that we can be together. I am grateful for that in many ways. And I hope that you are too. Amen.
Please join in hymn 336, We Gather Together. One of my uh, favorite uh, calls to worship, uh, if you've been around a while and uh, you know that I have used this frequently, it's just, uh, it's one of my favorites. And uh, so today, as we are celebrating um, thankfulness for being together, I share with you together these words that Jesus said, um, come to me, all you who are weary, and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I invite you to join me now in affirming what we believe through the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you'd like a frame of reference, it's on page 35 in the front part of our hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving God thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to all of them, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and he poured into it, saying, this is my blood that is poured out 
and shed for you. And this is the sign of the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. As often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink from this cup, we remember Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ who will come again. Will you bow with me in prayer? Holy God, we are grateful. We are grateful to be together today. We are grateful that we have confidence to enter into your presence. Grateful that we are united with Christians of every time and place in this bread and through this cup through your body broken, through your blood spilled, through your power over death itself, through your promises that you make to us. So God, help us to be grateful as we taste and see that you are good. Amen. So somewhere near where you are seated, there should be a prepackaged communion kit. So... Um, and if you will find the little tab on the side and lift up the clear film, you will find a communion wafer, our bread for this morning, the body of Christ, broken, given for us. And you can remove the second top. If you have nimble fingers. Help each other. Yeah. <laughs> the blood of Christ poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Let our prayers continue, since this is a Labor Day weekend, tomorrow being the Labor Day holiday, uh, per se. You might hear some words about labor and about working. Um, if you're, uh, I saw one of the most magnificent arrays of young families and children and, and infants when I was at Washington Park, which is a park that my granddaughter, who's Caleb's age, six, we were there, I went to show her my favorite tree. And, uh, and then we played with all the other kids, it was great. There were uh, dozens and dozens of kids there, it was just magnificent. And uh, so as we were uh, playing and getting to know each other, I turned and there was a, a, a woman there uh, with uh, a small baby, and I said, well, how old is your baby? She was born on Monday, and this was yesterday. <laughs> so she said, we needed to get out of the house. I think you can relate to that. So let our prayers continue for the church, for the world, and for all people in need, anywhere, everywhere. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray for the church throughout the world that her members, ministers, and ministries may be agents of your forgiveness and grace. We pray for our nation, our leaders, and all who labor to make this country free and a haven of blessing, justice, and peace. We pray for the world that you would pass through our lands and once again bring freedom and life for all your children. We pray for our brothers and sisters in this community and especially those who celebrate this week, those celebrating birthdays, those celebrating anniversaries. We pray for the sick, the suffering, the fearful, and all who live in the wake of terror and destruction, especially
Oh God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of stewardship and work. Deliver us in our various occupations from the service of self alone, that we may do our work in truth and beauty and for your glory and the common good. God of justice, we pray for all workers that they would receive fair compensation and treatment for their labor. For those seeking work, provide jobs. For those unable to work, provide sustenance. Make those who lead industries and commerce of this country responsive to your perfect will. Build up in the leaders of our country a respect for all labors. Deliver us, O oh God, from the maligning evils of greed, sloth, and gluttony, that we may lead lives of holiness in service to you and one another. We pray all this knowing that your labors on our behalf never cease and that we continue to be blessed when we pray together. The prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in your hymnal number 300. We are one in the spirit. We have as part of our worship services a time of offering. Uh, we always highlight once, you know, or, or several times per year that you can give to the deacons. So just a reminder that you can give online to the deacons if you have the little uh, drop-down box, or you can write deacons on a special check if you'd like a special offering to the, the care ministries of this church. 
uh, and that offering is as you go out. And again, I am grateful for the generosity of this church. Sisters and brothers, I am grateful to be together. So let us connect so that we may grow and live and not be disconnected where we wither and die. Let us be grateful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.